name is Flora, and I'm actually a postdoc in mathematics, so it's not a usual profile in this, in this uh, community. And I'm going to present a library that I have developed for in the context of uh, fusion reactors that I have been working on uh, with uh, Didier Vézinet from the CA in Garage, and I am in IRIA, uh, National Laboratory in France. So uh, I know the title, the official title has a lot of words that not everybody knows. I don't, I don't know if somebody knows what uh, tokamak means here, but I'm going to explain everything in, uh, in the beginning, uh, give a little bit of a description of the actual, uh, actual problem, then uh, describe the library that we have developed and how we have optimized it and what's following, what we have to do next. So the general context of, of my research in general is to have a better way to produce energy. So we, I think, I hope everybody here is know that we have a big, big issue with uh, energy generation. So we are more and more people in the world, we are consuming more and more energy, and uh, the reality is that we don't have enough resources or uh, we cannot accommodate all of this uh, consuming of energy. Because all, all the means that we have to produce energy are to have major products. It can be uh, is emitting too much CO2, it can be that there's not enough resources, or that it's uh, damaging the environment, uh, their radioactive waste, and so on. So, uh, this is the real motivation behind uh, energy created by a fusion reactor. So, what is fusion and how do we obtain it? Fusion is when you have two light atoms that will have a really high energy, that will collide with each other and they will fuse together and create a bigger, heavier one. There is a neutron particle that is liberated with a really high energy, and this energy from, from the neutron we are going to get back, and this is how we are, so, uh, this is the principle how we are going to get the, the energy from the reaction. So, how can you get to these particles to collide with each other? Because this is not natural what would happen. So, you would take a gas, for example, of two uh, isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium to such a really high temperature that they are moving so fast that at some point they will collide and they will fuse together to get the reaction. Just uh, uh, a single point that I have to say is that the gas is to such a high temperature that the electrons and the atoms separate from each other and the whole mass is uh, ionized, so there, there are positive ions and electrons. The global charge is still no, of course, because there wasn't uh, any change of uh, energy. But um, yeah, the matter is in, is in another state. It's no longer gas, it's plasma. And just for the fun fact, plasma is what the sun is made of, and it's also 99% of the visible universe in the world. So this is the principle, but in reality, we haven't had have a reactor, a fusion reactor that is capable of producing energy. So far, we have there are several little machines that we call tokamak that, um, that do have fusion reactions, but they have never been able to produce more energy than the energy that they have to put in the machine to make the reaction happen. So this is why there is a big uh, construction being made in the south of France to have a bigger tokamak where I hope, or we hope that we can make to this break even point where we produce at least as much energy as we put in the reaction. And um, yeah, there are other shapes of, uh, of devices, but we're interested in this shape that we call tokamak. So what is tomography? Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit just to show. Um, in, because it's such a huge device, it has to be also in vacuum because you don't want any impurities to be in the plasma. It's important to be able to know what's happening in the machine without, without opening, or without uh, disturbing the event. So all, everything that you see uh, around the vacuum vessel are mostly, they're not, not only that, they're coils to uh, confine the plasma because you don't want it to touch the walls and there's antennas to hit the plasma and so on, but there are also some cameras and some uh, diagnostic machines to measure the, whatever is going on in the plasma. So you can measure the magnetic field, the neutrons, the emitted light and so on, the temperature, all of this is really important for the physicists to know what's happening in the tokamak without, um, yeah, or happening what, knowing what's happening inside the tokamak. So, a little bit of math because I'm still a mathematician, so um, 
I said there are little cameras, so it's something similar to this, or represented some, somewhere around there. And we are uh, having measurements, so you, from your camera, you will get some information, some data, and this is M, and it's actually just a um, sum, a uh, 3D sum, let's say, of a certain um, whatever you're measuring. So if you're measuring the visibility or the temperature, this will be uh, epsilon over a certain volume that depends on the geometry of these uh, fancy orders, or just to say it depends on, on the machine you're measuring or whatever the volume you're measuring. And in the community where we are, there are two ways of seeing the sperm. One is to see it as a direct product. So this is probably coming from the fact that uh, you have a mathematical code that measure at some point in the plasma, at a given time and a given space, you will have this given emissivity, where it should uh, be this hot. And, uh, and you want to know what the physicists on the other side they should be getting, the, what they should be getting, um, yeah, perceiving from the camera. Uh, this is what called synthetic, synthetic diagnostics, so you're going to, from epsilon to n, and the only thing you have to do is a uh, three integral, so it's a sum, uh, three time sums, which is not too hard to do. But for the inverse problem, so from the physicist, physicist's point of view, they have only the measurements and they want to know what does that mean to, for a given point in time and space inside the vacuum machine. So if they measure here a certain quantity, what does it mean? It was, uh, how many degrees was it in a, in a certain point? So another thing, um, oh sorry, if for, for solving this problem, there's a lot of, it's a little bit more complicated because it's not only a sum to solve, it's an inverse problem, so you have to construct a, a matrix. So this matrix will depend on the geometry, will depend, you will have to make a big or a accurate enough mesh to know what's happening inside the token. And, um, and, and, and you need uh, yeah, special integration and inversion methods to, to get again the, um, the epsilon. So this is what we call an inverse problem in mathematics. And this, the tomography problems are already known to be really ill both. So it means that it, they are really sensible to noise and bias. So and yeah, so it's really hard to get results that are re reproductible easily enough and that are actually reliable. So when you have a lot of publications, you never know what's, if it's mathematically uh, if there is a difference between your results and the, and the paper. You never know if it's mathematically. Or computer science, of, or even what you measure, or the West noise, or something. So it's, uh, it's a really big problem in the community. And uh, to top all, in, to top up all of this, the problem is that in the community there is no DevOps uh, philosophy. So what happens right now when there there is a PhD student that has to have some tomography diagnostics, he will start from zero. He will start a, a, a code. Probably he does, he has never coded before. He would do it probably in MATLAB, and he uh, would do it alone. Maybe at the end of his PhD, he would publish one, two papers. He would never give the source of, of his code, and that's it. Then he's going to move on to a postdoc somewhere, and we never know if the results were accurate or not, or, or how did he got these results. So it means that every time there's a new PhD, or a new postdoc, or a new whoever working on, on a new machine, he will have to start again from zero, do more or less the same thing and get maybe similar results, maybe not, but we will not we will know what's what's happening. So the standardization of the results are are where to slow, let's say this hopefully it's changing little by little and we're, we want to be able to uh, how to say um, upgrade the status of these results uh, or be part of, of a more communal um, um, yeah mining my thought, let's say. So, uh, the idea was to build a program that is generic, so you, you can work from any tokamak. And as I said, there are many devices that fusion reactors all around the world work. So it has to be able to work with whatever machine they have. It has to be portable because most people will want to code in their computers or in the server, in the server somewhere. So this is why we chose to use Python. It has to be optimized and uh, hopefully parallelized because uh, there are really big codes that, or big simulations that we have to do. So, and if the code is, is if it is too slow, nobody's going to use it. So, it has to be uh, optimized. It has to be documented online so you know how to use it, and it has to um, have some type of 
continuous iteration in, a, in order to know that uh, what you are, the results that you're always getting are accurate. And this is how Tofu was born. It was created in 2014, so just a few words on uh, the history of Tofu. Um, it was supposed to, or it was until this week, supporting Python 2.7 and Python 3. Now it's only Python 3. It has a Cyton backend or Cyton for all everything that is for the course functions of the library. It has continued integrations with Travis CI, uh, it's packaged with Conda and Pip, uh, and we are two core developers, uh, Didier Sine, who was a creator, he was a physicist that was uh, that actually learned the code at the beginning, and I joined the project in June 2015. And um, yeah, with a your Grant. And now there are more and more contributors, so we're really happy about this, and uh, we hope there are more people that are going to join us. But um, let's see a little bit the structure of, of the library. So, as I said, there are two products the direct and the inverse problem. The direct problem, you have, as I said, uh, data that you got from a code, so it's simulated. The, you need to know what geometry this is belonging to, and with a spatial integration, you will get the measurements that you're supposed to have. From the inverse problems, as I said, you need the, everything that comes from the geometry, so the basis functions and the geometry matrix, in order to construct the geometry matrix. And from your experimental data, after you filter it and you go and uh, pass it to inversion routines, you can reconstruct the receipt. So these are the main, all the black boxes are the main parts, models of stuff. So, let's see a little bit, because all of this is uh, the theory or the context, so let's see a little bit what's how what Tofu looks like. So this was, or this is the biggest tokamak that, we, uh, that we're going to have in the near future. And as you can see, to, if I want to simulate this geometry, it's completely, I mean, it would take a lot of time. It's really gigantic. And just as a reference, here is a human. And uh, the details in here you're gonna see that this, you can go to the millimeter uh, of, or you need to have on, until the millimeter of accuracy. So the scale is also really important. So first thing first, actually I don't need to represent everything that is outside the vacuum machine. I just need whatever is happening inside here. And this is a, a door, of course, it's closed. So um, how did we represent this in Tofu is to have something simple. Or we, we decided to say, okay, let's make it the simplest as possible. And what you can see is that because it's, it's a, a donut, a torus, Everything can be symmetric along the center of axis. So we just represent one polyhedral pl uh, plane, sorry. So it's like a cut section. And you represent everything that you have in there. So the, all of these little uh, cells here are more or less the cells that you have there. And you can see here, there's uh, this part that's called the inverter. It's also represented here. And the view on the right is a view from above. So you can see that they are not always continuous, but there is a symmetry along, along the way. Of course, this is uh, simplified, but it's really, really accurate and really close to reality, and it's what we need. So, the diagnostics on the set, there's, you can see it as cameras, and uh, a camera 1D we already know how to represent, so it will be just a set of lines, of lines of sight, which is LOS that you can uh, actually already plot in Tofu, you can see where, it's, where, you're, where you're measuring and from above and from the side. You can also have 2D cameras, so this camera here is what would you get, or is there a representation of what you would get if you was looking inside at one of the doors. And again, you can see a, a little bit more in detail each line of uh, from the camera. Um, Tofu now is also available to, is also possible to see the reflections of one ray because there are some uh, quantities for which you need to know where is the ray reflecting from. So it's really important uh, for physicists to have this, uh, this capability, so you can see it there, uh, for both 1D and 2D cameras. Right? And there are many more things that Tofu can do, but because you are not in this domain, I guess you don't care so much about these details. But, um, so you can compute synthetic signals, it has interface with some uh, platforms from the community and so on. And uh, there are many also many more things that we are working on already and that, we're, that are going to happen really fast. So 
those particle uh, tra trajectory tracking. So uh, to be able to, sometimes there, do there is dust inside the, the tokamak, so you will have to be able to know where is it coming from at some point to see the impurities in, in the reaction. Uh, faster method lib or using QQT graph uh, for the visualization for, for the moment is working quite okay, but there's some things that I think we can make it more clear and more advanced. And many other things that uh, I'm gonna just move on to the part that I'm most excited to talk about, which is uh, the optimization of the code. And the biggest part that I optimized was um, the retracing algorithm. So, as I said, the representation of the door is really complicated because there are so many structures, and there are so many parts that are uh, different sizes. So, and you have to be able to be uh, accurate to uh, at least 10 to the uh, power of 4 uh, accuracy from the biggest elements to the smallest elements. So, how, you, how can you make this algorithm to go fast? Because at the beginning it was going really slow, and most people don't even have it in the code because it's really complicated. So, because we decided to have a simplified geometry, we can also improve our ray tracing technique to something a little bit more mathematically um, still 100% accurate, but simple. So, instead of doing a computer intersection between a ray, a ray and a door, we're gonna just do a um, a compute intersection between a ray and a section of a, of a cone because if we represent the torus not as a perfect circle but as a um, grouping of segments, you can see that each segment, when you um, rotate it around the, the central axis, it forms a cone and actually a section of a cone. So if you see here the AD, it forms like a little base of a pyramid, let's say, of a, a round pyramid. So, computing the intersection between a ray and, a, and two circles or, uh, or a cone is much more easier. You can write it as a, the equation of a cone and the equation of a vector, and solving this mathematically is quite easy. So, how do we optimize the ray tracing algorithm? First of all, and I think this is the reality for anything, you have to optimize your algorithm. You have to uh, make it mathematically the Best that you can before optimizing the code, in my opinion. So even before computing intersection between a cone and an array, we decided to uh, compute intersection between an array and a bounding box of, of the whole um, structure that you want to see if the ray intersected or not. We're gonna also treat the special cases for the ray, the special cases for the structure, to see if there's anything that we can simplify mathematically in order to know how to have so many compute, computations. And um, in the worst case scenario, just if you have to compute the intersection between n cones and n rays, is just the solution of n quadratic equations. So it's not so complicated. Uh, other points that really uh, help optimize the algorithm for pre computed variables, we put all the core functions in Cyton, and we use the fact that uh, with Cyton it's really easy to parallelize the code using uh, B range loops. If anybody does Cyton, I hope this. So something which in the back is uh, open MP. So it's not so complicated. Um, so what did we got? So the original original code was so slow that I couldn't put uh, any of the results for the first line. I mean for yeah for any of the, of the computation here. So what it says original it was a original with a really dirty uh, site conversion of the core functions. And if you see here for a million. Um, Lines of sight, so trying to intersect a million lines of sight with the, the whole geometry, it was taking almost nine hours. After optimizing it, and mostly with the uh, mathematical part that it was optimized, it was taking less than 30 seconds. And parallelized is scalable, so it always depends on the number of threads that you have, of course, but it can take three seconds on 32 threads. So this is really nice because it can almost be done uh, live from, from the from the geometry, I mean, from the experiments, you can almost have directly your results. So, um, I said the ray tracing is really important, but there's another really important part is the spatial integration, because this is used uh, for the direct part, but actually also for the inverse part. So, how do you integrate in 3D space? There are many, many ways that you can have, or there are many packages that give you something of how to integrate, because integration is more or less a sum. 
So we took advantage of this, we tried different um, options, so there's none, none by some. Also, SciPy has uh, integrations routines using Simpson and Rob and Rob Rolling, Robert, sorry. Um, quadratures and uh, also I implemented one pure inside them, so something really similar to C using a midpoint quadrature. Um, we also give some other options because <coughs> we know that uh, when you want to integrate a function, the function is given by the user. So the user, as I said, sometimes is somebody who doesn't know how to code, so it could be really badly written. Uh, so it could be that you, the user doesn't trust himself and he knows that if the function is called many, many times, the code is going to be slow. So he says maybe, I don't want to call my function so much, I want to optimize the number of times that you're going to call it. Or you can, it can be that you have a really big problem and you know that if you're running your computer, it's going to uh, have a memory, uh, you're going to be out of memory. So you might want not to have so much memory consumption. Or you can try an algorithm that is kind of in the middle. So it's a hybrid method that tries to use less memory and tries to run as fast as possible. So the original um, algorithm was taken for a thousand lines um, or a thousand points, sorry. It was um, being computed in 80 seconds. If you see the memory part, it's taking almost 100 seconds, so it's much more slower. But the, the other two algorithms that we propose are running in almost what, um, four times faster. Um, but you can ask why are you implementing something that is slower than the original, and it's because it's the only algorithm that goes into 10 to the fifth power for, um, for any computation. So if I went further away, this one was already a uh, loss of memory with 10,000 lines, as well as the cold ones. So, and it's using much less uh, memory overall. Um, so what I have learned, or we have learned in general, so how to optimize a code that it was that is such a heavy code for the for the community, let's say, for simulations. So I think for me the most important lesson that I have taken away is that it's really important to have different disciplines or different experts in different disciplines. So you cannot, or I couldn't have done this without physicists that can know exactly what's the problem. They can tell you, this is exactly what I need, this is what we're going to get, this is what, what did the geometry, and this is the, the actual problem that we have. You cannot have a, so a code that is optimal, I think that is really optimal without having a mathematician that goes after it and says, okay, this is the complexity of the algorithm, this, this is the way that you compute uh, an accurate uh, integral or that you compute a solid angle or whatever. And you cannot have a code that is readable and is portable and that is somehow usable for everybody if you don't have a computer scientist or uh, IT or someone for the source. So I think once you, or my first suggestion would be Try to find people that are from different communities to help you because I think this is the most useful part. But once you go from there, uh, if you want to optimize the code, profile your code because every time that we try to optimize at the beginning, you think this is for sure the function that is quite slow. You try to optimize it and then you see, mm, no, <laughs> it's not changing anything. So profile your code. Um, we decided to write the core functions inside them, which made a big difference from the beginning, but there are other packages like. Number or Sonic or uh, Python and so, so many others. But uh, what I can say from this Python is use the tool that Python gives you, like annotate to know exactly where um, your code is the heaviest. Uh, type your variables because in Python you don't need to type the variables, but once you do it, your code is going to go so much faster. Inline your functions so that the overload uh, of calling the functions is much easier. And use the decorators from Python because this makes a uh, night and day difference. And also release the guild whenever it's possible because, uh, yeah, in Python already you're always holding the guild, or not always, but most of the time. And once you release it, it's easier. Oh, you can parallelize your code for starters, and you can also run your um, code really faster. And if you are interested in like optimizing the code, there is, I really like this tutorial by uh, Jeremy Dubois-Beranger. Uh, he gave a really nice presentation in your sci-fi this year. And I also have some notes or uh, a Jupyter notebook 
that have some of the things that I have found that are really make a difference in a cycle, in a cycle flow. So, what's next? There are many things actually that we're still planning. I said that cameras can be seen as a set of lines, which is not totally honest because it's not really lines, it's, it's still 3D, so it should be a volume of sight and not a line of sight. Um, more advanced reflection, so it's not the same if you reflect a ray into a mirror or if you reflect it into a, or a plane mirror or into a sphere. So all of this uh, has to be taken into account. Um, more advanced machines, uh, techniques, inversions, and yeah, many other things that we want to. For just a small part, a small point, the, what I'm gonna be working next is to working on the machine because for a moment it looks something like this, which, which is the reality for most calls of the pieces that I have seen, just a Cartesian mesh that doesn't really represent anything on, from the boundaries. And we want to move to something a little bit more seeable or uh, yeah, CAD, let's say. Um, it has still to be somehow regular, somehow uh, mathematically optimized, but uh, we're planning to go with these plans, maybe nerves, something like this. That's it. Thank you for attention. Are there any questions? At the moment, what are we going uh, to use for graphics, Matplotli? Yeah, we use only Matplotli for the moment, but we are uh, planning to move with uh, PQ, PQ, T, sorry, PQT, uh, these are the tools. Respect. <laughs> Matplotli is wrong. <laughs> yeah, actually, you can do a little thing with Matplotli. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Basically, let me see if I can make this bigger somehow. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> as I said, Pierre cannot be here, so I'm gonna present for him. It's a talk that I don't really know everything. I mean, I'm not an expert on everything that, I, that I'm gonna present, but I have seen him talk, so I hope I can do his code justice and present something that is uh, good. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how to make your numerical Python code fly at transonic speed. So, uh, this code with transonic was developed by Pierre Roger and Ashwin Pichnou and Pierre Blanc Fatin. So, what is it? It's a new package. It's a new package to make your code uh, uh, faster. It's, unified, uh, it's a unified modern API for Python and Open Accelerations. Uh, it's a thin layer actually in between your Python code and Python, uh, Python Cyton and um, non sorry. So, who is Pierre Olé who abandoned me to do his talk here? <laughs> Pierre is a scientist in the CNRS. He did his PhD in fluid dynamics and he developed a code for fluid dynamics. So, fluid dynamic simulations are known also to be really heavy and big and um, yeah, this is how uh, fluid in start. Um, oh, yeah, so it's based in Python and it's in this environment of all these different packages that are in Python. But um, the problem is that, or not the problem, but the situation in the Python community or the Python environment it is that the only really Python thing that we have is Python and all these packages that are written there, they're written with core functions that are in C or in PyPy or are different types of Python. So, is it possible to have a Python, a pure Python package that is actually efficient? So this is uh, the question we're trying to ask. Uh, with a Python at least 3.6 of course, with a NumPy API and an API that is able to describe types because, as I said, Python doesn't have, you don't usually declare the types of the variable, so it will uh, be good to have something like that. And, as I said, Python is really bad to actually crunching numbers, so making big computations with a lot of numbers, 
It is why usually you have uh, both written in C, Python, or PyPy with C extensions like NumPy, SciPy, all of these are based something there. So, uh, yeah, is it really a problem that the, all those, these packages that we have here are not really only written in Python, they are there having a lot of C, C++, Fortran background? Is, is that really a problem? So, not totally percent. <laughs> But if you see, if you compare it to something like Julia, who, uh, which is a code that is everything, all the packages inside in Julia are written in Julia, uh, you can see it's not such a nice thing. So this is where Transonic's interface. It's a pure Python package, so everything is written in Python. Um, it keeps your Python NumPy in code keying, in the sense that you see it as a Python code and not something with C, interfaces or, or, or anything of the type. We have clean type annotations of uh, Python type. Uh, it's easily uh, mixed with Python and some compile functions that you have somewhere else if you actually need them. It is um, have two types of compilations, so it can be uh, compiled with a uh, ahead of time compilation or just in time compilation. Um, the just-in-time compilation is based on the ahead-of-time compilation, which is especially true for uh, Python, which makes uh, a big difference in the results that I'm going to show afterwards. And um, it is able to accelerate your functions, your methods, and uh, I mean the method that's the functions of your classes, and the blocks of code, so quite a broad spectrum. Um, it's a work in progress, so it's still not totally finished, but it's, it's being done. For the moment, it only has two, uh, three backgrounds, sorry, Python, site and number, but this is probably, I mean, the intention that is going to cover more packages. So, let's see a little bit how, what does it look like. Um, so, for ahead of time combination, you have, let's say, a function, you want to sum a given matrix row by row. So, if you do it this, the most patronic way, it would look something like this. There is something that you maybe won't recognize, for example, the uh, type description. Here T0 describes a matrix, T1 describes a vector, and uh, you are just doing a sum. The second function is exactly the same, it's doing the same, but it's a more low-level low uh, function where you have two integrated formulas. But it's still doing exactly the same. Um, okay, um, the transonic part is this boost decorators. So you're basically not changing your code. You're just adding these decorators, which is not too bad. And some flags to, to make it go faster. For the just-in-time, this was for the ahead-of-time compilation. For the just-in-time, it's even a little bit more evident. So if you have a code that you have a function that is just calling another function, you just have to add a decorator to say, this function, I want you to compile uh, just-in-time with a just-in-time compilation. And for even the functions that are being called from your phone, from the function that you're going to optimize, they are all going to be automatically um, compiled, which is really nice. Um, for the types, you can, if you are, have done Cyton before or you know, probably Python as well, uh, sometimes it can get a little bit complicated when you have complex types that are, for example, a set of uh, an integer, a real, and a complex number. But uh, Transonic makes it in a really elegant way, so you can find a new type just by calling the type function. You can um, set the number of dimensions for an array with using the, the function type md, and the, also um, an array uh, type or yeah, an array type to describe your arrays. And at the end, it looks something more or less like that, so it's really elegant. And the boost as well, just to to do the ahead of time compilation first. Um, there's also some capabilities that you have if, uh, in Cyton, for example, inline functions. You just need to specify it in the boost uh, decorator. And at the end, the, the add function is not going to be, there's not going to be the overhead uh, time that is more, yeah, the overhead calling time. It's just uh, completely inline, so it makes it go faster. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it also accelerates methods of classes. And for this as well, 
and again, it's really nicely done. It's just you put a decorator boost for the class and for the method. And yeah, so those are the basic examples of transonic. And probably now you're thinking, okay, so you're talking about Cyclone, you're talking about uh, a number and, uh, and sorry, Python. So is it just another Python accelerator where we see? So not really. Why? Because it's in making it accessible or compatible to use all different accelerators in just one library. It's not, it doesn't have the Cyclone he hegemony, so it doesn't look like something that is not Python. If you have seen a Cyclone code, you will see that it looks like uh, C or C++, so it's not as pretty and as uh, readable as Python. So it's trying to solve that. And um, it's also promoting as well a lot the use of Python, which is one of the fastest accelerators for the moment for Python, and that is not being used so much in the community, so it's, it's nice. So in, in general, how can you uh, have a better performance in, in your code? So first things that you have to do, or the base of your code should be that you should be nice in the sense that it's readable, um, that it's maintainable, and that is also, of course, accurate. You don't want a code that is not going to give you the right result. Um, and you have to make it somehow in a, set, in a way that it doesn't take you too much time to, to write it, of course. It has to be, um, yeah, it has to be a balance between your time and the energy that you spend in your, in your code. And it has to be a little bit general and readable or documented as well. But, um, I almost also put this in my previous talk, he said that premature optimization is the root of all evil. So don't optimize all the functions of your of your program or your simulations because this is not optimizing small functions is not gonna take you anywhere. So instead of just guessing profile your code, find the the real bottlenecks of, of where the simulation is taking the more time and go from there. Always have unit tests in your code because if you are trying to optimize a code, you're going to break something at some point. Everybody does it, so make sure just that you can check where and when uh, there's a breakage in your code. Um, use the right algorithms, and I hope this rings back uh, also at a bell from my talk, in the sense that uh, optimizing computer science-wise a code is important, but also optimizing the algorithm that you're using is really important. Um, and yeah, uh, proper compilation is needed for very high performance. So, um, yeah, so um, not all the functions that you're gonna have are, have to be optimized, just the kernel functions. And at, at the end, the difference between your original code and, and the transonic code, let's say, is just gonna have small changes like this. Um, you have to have, as I said, a really proper compilation to get the proper uh, efficiency. Not like in C Python, where you do compile to get a high-level virtual machine Python instruction, but something a little bit, uh, a little bit different. I have talked a little bit about just-in-time and ahead-of-time compilations. Um, I don't know if everybody is familiar with this, but just-in-time has to be fast because it's what you do on the on the run, like when you you're just executing your code if there's a little compilation part. So it has to be able to, to do it really quickly because you don't want to be waiting a long time to, for the code to lead a kit. And it can be hardware specific in order to make this time really small. The ahead of time, you can make it slower because you're going to do it ahead of time, literally, and so you're going to do it just once. And, or, yeah, once and before your package is uh, packaged. And um, it can be hardware specific or a little bit more general because it doesn't matter so much the time that uh, it's compiling. And so the first step for your Python is uh, transpilation, which means from one language to another, for example, when you're uh, transforming your Python to C++. And I hope that this is not some, or what we hope with Transonic, it's some, this is something that you won't see. Um, so, so many tools, right? Python, not that Cyclone, and I'm saying so many more less known than Pixel, PyPy, MX. And if you have been interested in optimizing a code, I'm pretty sure you have been in this point where you're trying to choose. So they are all compiling at some point your Python library, but at which level? 
So for example, Rita, it, it uh, compiles the whole program. PyPy uh, compiles the slowest loops. Uh, Python and Cyton modules. Uh, Transonic, actually, as I said, it does the process of codes, uh, methods, functions, and also, oh no, that's it. Also, user functions and methods. And uh, NumPy and Python, there are uh, known code compiling functions. Um, so, let's see a little bit the difference between all, all of these libraries and see what was the change. So, Cyton is a great mix of Python, C, C++, and uh, C Python API. It's very, very powerful. It's one of the most known and most used uh, ways of optimizing Python code. It, there are a lot of tools that make you interpret uh, what you're doing with Cyton and let you see where it's going to take more time to, to compile. It's very mature, so it, there are a lot of users. There is, there are a lot of developers and it's really a well-maintained library. It's really portable as well, so you can install it easily or as anywhere. And um, it's really efficient, like C-like, so it's almost the best that you can have. And, uh, and now it's able to use it in Python, in Python internally. So uh, this is Pian's comment on mine that he says, large site and extensions are difficult to maintain. And to be honest, I also agree with this because when you're having a Python code, is Python is really easy to, to learn. Cython, you're gonna use pointers, you're gonna use uh, malloc, you're gonna use so low level utility from C or, or also utility from C++. So the code is a little bit less uh, maintainable in general, but less people are gonna be able to code in, in your package. So it's true that it's not, yeah, that this is the biggest downfall from Cython. Number. So number is also one is more and more known, it's more and more used because it's really elegant, it's really similar to what you can see from uh, Transonic. You also have just decorators from your function. It's really simple to use, to learn, you just add four characters and your code is running four times faster, so it's really uh, yeah, appealing, let's say. You have two modes, a non-Python mode, which means that it's gonna translate whatever function you wrote to something in C or C++. Here, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's gonna be totally no Python and gonna not, don't, it's gonna release the guild. That if you know the guild, what the guild is, it's important to uh, not take it when you're not using it, let's say. So it's faster. There's also a Python mode, so if it's not gonna compile with the no Python mode, you can at least have an optimization using the Python mode. You can run on GPU, which is also great, and compile. And uh, you can accelerate methods of classes, which not all packages do, so this is nice. However, there's some downfalls. It's only just in time compilation, so there's no ahead of time compilation. Sometimes it's not as efficient as it could be, and I have tried this as well myself. I have a um, Julia code that runs, I don't know, let's say two seconds, and the same code with uh, Numba was running in five, say, six seconds. So is not always as efficient as it could be. And it's no, not good to optimize high-level non-Python. Non so this is, of course, they are working on this. It's also an uh, open source library that is really active and a really nice community, but it's not perfect yet. And the last one that I, I'm happy mentioning is Python. It's, it's a ahead of time compiler. Uh, it will write your Python code to C++. So it's really, uh, Efficient, efficient code in UA. It's really good to optimize high level NumPy code, which is nice because what we do most of the time is high level NumPy. Um, what else? So, yeah, it's pure C, so there, it doesn't use the, the guild, which is perfect. You can uh, probably parallelize this there. So, it's usually very efficient. And most, sometimes faster than Julia, which is, uh, yeah, if you are in academics, you know that Julia is being more, used more and more, so, because it's really easy to write in it and it's uh, um, usually really fast. So, it's nice to have an alternative for Python as well that can have the same result as Julia. It's uh, high and low level optimizations, so, because it's based on uh, C. 
SIMD, I'm not 100% sure what it is, but if you have a question, you can ask uh, the help already. And it's understand open and the instructions so you can parallelize your code without not knowing so much how to parallelize a code. This is uh, nice. Um, yeah, it can be used and uh, made by capsules, which is also really nice. Um, there, of course, there are some downfalls. So it only compiles full models, so you will need to do some refactoring. There, there is no no Python code, so there is only a subset of functions of Python that are uh, in Python. And yeah, there is no method you cannot uh, py, uh, Pythonize let's say, <laughs> methods of classes and uh, or use of defined classes. It's only a few extensions packages there are, so NumPy, which is most important for us, and a little bit of SciPy, which is also used a lot in the academic uh, community, let's say. Um, Pythonized functions cannot call Python functions, which is not great. There's no uh, just-in-time compilations, so it needs types. You have to type all your variables. It can take some time. It's a little bit hard to debug, so you need to know a little bit more, more about C++. And still, there is no uh, parallelization on the GPU, which is uh, sad. <laughs> but yeah, I hope it's coming sometime soon. And I think more of these downfalls comes from the fact that there are not so many people still in the in the library or coding the library. There's only one core developer, so uh, yeah, it has the best results from all the mm -hmm. packages that we have mentioned, but it's still a small uh, package. So first conclusion: Yeah, Python is great for developing code. It's, you can write code really easily. You have a ecosystem of uh, ecosystem sorry of a lot of different packages and. Uh, this is great, but you can, if you are doing a lot of computations with big matrices and so on, you're going to have uh, to ask yourself at some point the question of how can I optimize my code. So you would need to uh, accelerate your numerical kernel. Sorry. And um, there are many good accelerators, but they all have their downfalls and their pros. And, yeah. and um, it's good for the diversity. Um, for the open source community to have such a diversification because you can get ideas from what the neighbor is doing, but uh, we shouldn't have to try and write a code that is using this package and only this package and this package. The idea of uh, Transonic is to have just one library that's gonna that we're, with, with which you can try whatever backend that you want. You with, with Transonic you can try Cyber, you can try Numba, you can try uh, Python. So this is the generative. So how does it work? It's uh, based on AST analysis. So again, not, not an expert in this myself, but um, I'm sure Pierre is going like, to be happy to answer any questions they have. It writes uh, the whatever package that you're using, Python, Numba, and Cyclone, uh, when, when it's needed. It compiles the file. Uh, it depends on which package you're using. If you're using Python and Cyclone, they will compile it when it's needed. And uh, use the in, you can use the fast solution whenever it's available. So if you want to see more examples, of concrete examples that I cannot show here because they are a little bit more complicated, but for uh, just-in-time compilation um, and ahead-of-time compilation, there are two great examples. Also for how to optimize plots of code or uh, using parallelism with a class. So um, there are a lot of things. But um, you should also know that you can do it for your script, so if you write it in a file, but you can also use it in IPython, and you can also use it in a Jupyter notebook, which is nice because this is what most people are doing now. Um, so let's benchmark a little bit the first example that I showed of how to compute the sum of, uh, or sum row, row by row of a matrix. So, I, this is exactly the same code, nothing special, uh, type declarations, the decorators here, and a low level, uh, sorry, a low level function and a high level function that are computing this, the, the same thing that is the sum row by row of a function. So, when you run only with Python, uh, the first one is, I'm going to take it as a reference, the high level, because this is what most people would write to write this uh, function. So it's taking 1.3 uh, microseconds, uh, mis yeah, whatever, milliseconds, sorry. <laughs> low level, uh, the low level, so the one with the two loops, is taking uh, 
a little bit more time, so 80, 80 times slower. But when you see the Python, uh, the site of our version, it doesn't do a much a, a big difference if you're using a high level, so using NumPy, it's almost exactly the same in Python and Cyton. But when you go to a low level, it's making a bigger difference, so three times faster than the than the Python version. And NumPy is more or less the same as Cyton, so it's a little bit faster for high level and a little bit faster for low level, but more or less in the same speed. But Python is making a huge improvement for high level, which is actually hard to do. So it means that from what is closest that you would have written already in your code, or maybe you already had it, something like this, uh, Python is making the biggest difference without you having to rewrite it in a more C or C++ way. But uh, also, if you have it, if, or if you wanted to write it in, in a low level way, you, you will get even better performance. Um, yeah, so this was for the ahead of time uh, compilation. Now let's see what happens for a uh, just in time compilation. Um, two functions that do more or less the same, um, oh, exactly the same, sorry. One without loops and one with loops, and um, using the just in time decorators. If you if you compare a pure numpy uh, or the pure numpy function, when you use the number backends, you get uh, some performance, not so much for just uh, the most high level version, but for the low level, you get um, a speed up. But with Python, using the, um, <coughs> using, yeah, using Python, uh, Python, sorry, for the high level version, you get almost five times faster than number with loops. So it's a pretty big difference. So in conclusion, Transonic is a unified API for different Python numpy accelerator. It's a new package, you probably, uh, I don't know if somebody has heard of it uh, before this talk. It's a long-term project and it's still in the making, but uh, it's getting there. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about the, the community, you can go to this link. And uh, it's, uh, the objective is that very efficient software can be written with uh, Transonic. There are many perspectives in, in or many things that we can still do. For example, uh, adding backends, because I said there are many packages to accelerate Python code. For example, Copy uh, and PyTorch are not still implemented in Transonic, so this would be nice to have it. Use it in more important packages like Scikit Image or Scikit-Learn or whatever other free packages there are. And um, improve the API, score my, more sites on Python and Numba, and so on. And I'm gonna end just with an error that they're having, and I hope they're looking for help. So if somebody's motivated and is really working on optimizing code, I think you can contact them for, for this. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you.